Hello everyone and welcome back to more AEW on TEW 2020. We are back here the third week of March, still continuing on with Dark, and of course BTE to start things off, Jackson to their intro, the Dark Order do their shenanigans, I'll eventually write some of these things out, maybe, I don't actually know yet. Uh, after this, our first proper skit of uh, this week is Priscilla Kelly, she's backstage. And she's stretching, uh, possibly for a match tonight, uh, when she's approached by Garza Jr., who hands her a rose. And, he, and compliments her look, and he's, you know, he's flirting with her, he's trying to grab her into the rose garden, because Priscilla Kelly, she is very attractive, but, you know. Right now, uh, this is, this save was before it was announced that, um, that Darby and Priscilla Kelly had broken off their engagement, so they are still, uh, engaged in this. Darby Allen walks over, pushes Garza aside, they just kind of stare down for a little bit, they're about the same height, so there's, you know, there's nothing really there, and then Darby kind of, he just walks off, Priscilla Kelly follows, and Garza, two BTEs in a row that he has failed to pick up a woman, uh, although those were taken women, but, you know, so has Penelope before, so. But this is Brian Cage, he's doing bicep curls, and, you know, he's doing other things with his weights, and he's, you know, really showing off how he's a big, strong boy, he's interrupted by Dallas Montello. He's a, I think he's technically a, a New Japan LA Dojo graduate, but whatever. And Mantello taps him on the shoulder and he compliments uh, Cage's white lips and Cage just kind of ignores him. You know, who's this random guy? Mantello keeps talking and eventually Cage just kind of sets down the weights. He punches Mantello in the face, picks up the weights and leaves and like Mantello, he's on the ground and he's like, yeah, that was, you got some real good muscles there, Cage. That punch. Really hurt, I can really feel the strength behind it. So kind of being this, uh, I, I'm gonna try to use BTE to kind of make a little bit more personality for some of the, uh, regens. Some of the, you know, people who don't actually exist in the real world. So Montello, kind of this overly happy bodybuilder type, I guess. After this, Patrick Scott is backstage and he's monitoring for himself. He was the voice of Kurt Angle. He's, you know, here's Kurt giving tips to someone. And he's like, all right, you know what, maybe I, can, maybe I can do a little bit of learning from this. So he looks in, and he sees that Kurt Angle is yelling instructions to Zack Sabre Jr., who still has, like, his mouth wired shut because uh, he broke his jaw in a squash match of Patrick Scott last week. And so there's a hastily taped picture of Patrick Scott on it. Pa camera pans back to see him, and he's like, oh, crap, what do I do now? He backs up a little bit. He bumps into the rest of FTR. Uh, best of, Ang uh, of Kurt Angle's people, and then Scott runs off, and these other three are like, what was that all about? And they just go in, and they go for their training with Kurt Angle, because, you know, he's still, ZSJ still can wrestle, he just, you know, might not be too comfortable with a broken jaw, but that should end off our BTE, I believe, and our first match is... Well, it's a good thing that I had El Hijo del Vikingo going over Griff Garrison. And they have great chemistry. Interesting. But Garrison broke his ribs. Thank you, Nakazawa. After this, Sean Spears defeats Benjamin Carter with a tiebreaker. Uh, ben Carter is brought in. Well, that shouldn't be a problem. Then we have Shotzi Blackheart and Chris Statlander defeating Elena Black and Harlow O'Hara. After Shotzi pins Elena Black with a Fright Knight. Then our other match of the youth tournament, Matt Murphy defeats Ben K with a Steelhead Kick. Big Swole defeats Diamante with a Blue Thunderbomb. And afterwards, Maki Ito's music... Ah, whatever. Uh, Maki Ito's music plays, and Big Swole just kind of looks disinterested. It's like, oh great, it's this again. Uh, Maki's, you know, getting back at Big Swole for interrupting Maki's concert last week. And then, once Maki's song is finished, Big Swole starts yelling at her. She starts making fun of, you know, Maki being, you know, failed idol. And Abdon, she crawls up from underneath the ring. She sneaks up on Swole, and Swole, she's still talking, she's still making fun, uh, uh, you know, still jawjacking with Maki Ito. Abaddon begins to attack. Ryoho runs in from backstage, past Maki, in order to save Big Swole. She chases Abaddon off, and Abaddon kind of just retreats to Maki's side, and then Maki leads her pet zombie to uh back to the backstage area so a little bit of an un a bit of an unusual alliance between big swole and riho but 
still something that could probably lead to a good match, I would imagine. I need to use Riho a little bit more. Um, I have a lot of undercard people that I need to start using more. Uh, after this, Jordan Grace, Mayuri Utani, and uh, the debuting Utami Hayashi Shida defeat uh, Nancy Bouchard, Raven Obscure, and Raven Creed when Utami picks up the win with a Samoan drop. Uh, Utami, pretty nice rating. Uh, not the best in terms of the pros and cons, but a great rating. Does work fine, and Utami, uh, still definitely behind Mayu and Jordan Grace, but she is also much less in popularity. AJ Mendes then defeats Danny Jordan, uh, still just trying to build up some momentum, such as for Ricky Starks defeating John Silver with the Buster Keaton. And that ends off our show of Dark, so we'll be moving ahead on to Dynamite. Moving on to our episode of Dynamite, we start off with the D&D group. Well, they did not have anything last week, mainly because I am starting to wrap this up because I kind of lost interest in it, to be honest. Um, right now... They've entered the castle, they've talked to King Silver, and King John Silver, of course. He is, you know, he's looking around, he's looking for something for them to do. And eventually, Matt Hardy points out that there's some rift in time and space. Um, guarded by, I don't know, some demon or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm doing great at selling this story, but, um... You know, Silver sends him off, he's been a bother to the kingdom, so, you know, that or that demon or whatever's been a bother to the kingdom, so he sends all of them off, and, yeah, next week I'll be ending things off, kind of rushing the ending because, eh, I have BTE now for the interesting things. As you'll notice, Matt Hardy, he's doing some changes, poor gimmick, unfortunately, but, uh, I probably could have just kept him as Broken Brilliance and just changed the gimmick name. But, oh well, I like being thorough. So yeah, soon enough, these eight people will be back to the real- Oh, seven people will be back to the real world. We start off our show with Jurassic Express defeating the Von Eriks in the Tag Team Number 1 Contenders Tournament. A pretty good performance, despite the Von Eriks being unimportant, but Arn Anderson, good work at ringside. The Von Eriks, they do have some good Tag Team bonus. So yeah, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. Jungle Boy, of course, the number one contender for the world title. He is also doing quite well. After this, the cameras quickly cut to backstage, where there's a bunch of people laid out, most noticeably Dustin Rhodes and Jake Hager. Brody Lee's standing over bodies, and he looks at the camera, and he says, You think you can just ignore me, Cody? You think that you can decide with the golden boy of pro wrestling, the king who toppled the so-called best wrestler in the world? You're damn wrong. Jericho, don't think I'm letting you go either. You're in my way. I'm not going to fall in line with you because you're out of touch now. I am the one that will make sure that this company rises to the top. Cody's first. Once, he out, once he's down, MJF is next. Dark Order will take over, mark my words. But this starts with you, Cody. Only with you. So this is mainly because I did forget uh, that Hager actually can't wrestle yet. So... Uh, take them out, get Dustin out of the way, just to kind of even things up, but that will change in a moment. After this, it then cuts away to MJF. He's looking in an expensive lounge, He's, he has a glass of champagne, and we can probably, probably just, you know, I didn't know this, but I was thinking that we have some of Jericho's, you know, a little bit of the bubbly, uh, but MJF has kind of like just taped his own face over, taped over VIP stuff on it, you know, like, I, you know, he does, he put, he puts his own merch on there, basically. And MJF, he's just talking to the mic. Um, you can probably tell, you know, maybe, like, we can hear from voices that it's, you know, maybe it's Chris Bay doing the recording or something like that, because, you know, this is, MJF doesn't let just plebeians in his lounge. He says, Jack, it's good to see that you haven't given up on being a tag team guy. So admirable of you, going for other titles with your little dinosaur friend. But I know why. It's because you're scared. You know you can't beat me. Because you know that I'm like you? I'm like you and your little Tarzan cosplay. I'm actually good. I'm good for the business. I made my own name. I made my own wealth. And I made myself as good as I am. I made sure that everyone around me is as almost as good as I am. No offense to 
any of my fellow co-workers. You were the son of a failed actor. Now you're pretending to be some wild savage. It doesn't matter. You're just the first speed bump on my way to being the greatest world champion Cena Wrestling has ever and will ever know. Because I'm better than you. And you know it. Actually did an MJF angle right where I just had him as the only one rated with his microphone. Maybe you're a little bit better with like a Moxley microphone in there as well, but still, this is perfectly fine. MJF just taunting Jungle Boy for, you know, being Jack Perry, son of Luke Perry, who I'm pretty sure is actually a pretty good actor. I don't really watch that much TV or movies or anything like that, so I don't know what Luke Perry was in, but whatever. After this, uh, Miroslav and The Vision defeats uh, Butcher Blade and Jacob Fox 2. After Matt Seidel picks up the win, uh, Seidel with a 61. Uh, Odie Brown, he's just a new referee. Um, this match promised last week, and, well, they've won. But after the match, Miro and Seidel hug each other, and they're happy with their teamwork. They did pretty well. You know, all three of them worked very well together. And Miro invites Archer into the group hug, but Archer refuses. He kind of pushes Miro, and then they get face-to-face. -face. They start arguing with each other, and then eventually Archer kind of, he backs up for a little bit, you know, like, kind of rocking on his heels, gives a huge lariat to Miro, knocks him over, and Archer, he's continuing to beat down Miro. Maybe Jake Roberts has a mic. He's probably planning on cutting a promo before now, but Matt Seidel grabs that from Jake Roberts. He runs into the ring and says, Lance, Lance! Calm down, I, I know that I need to work with you more. Miro, I think our time together is done. We've done good work. I'm glad you got your anger under control, but me and Lance, and Lance, he kind of, you know, as as Seidel is talking, Lance walks over, takes the mic from Seidel. Seidel probably recoils a little bit. He's a little bit scared because, you know, Lance Archer is a very big guy. Matt Seidel, not the biggest guy. Well, especially compared to Lance Archer. And Archer just says, tag titles, Matt. We're getting those goddamn titles without Miroslav. And Seidel nods. He's, you know, he's still happy with this. It's, you know, obviously there is still some of that fear factor in Seidel right now because, you know, he's worried. Hey, is my buddy going to also attack me? But no, Archer, he's, you know, uh, Archer, he, he hates everyone except for Jake Roberts and Matt Seidel. Everyone else, they die. These two, they die later. Uh, and Archer, he pushes the mic back into Seidel. Seidel just kind of grabs it. Archer picks up Powerbombs Miro a few times before he leaves the ring. Jake Roberts follows soon after. Matt Seidel, he also then leaves the ring last, but he does look a little bit guilty that he kind of allowed this to happen and that he is still working with Lance Archer, but he does know that his best chance for getting a title, aside from his current Ring of Honor world title, is this team with Lance Archer because they do have that great chemistry. Lance Archer is also pretty cool, and this actually turns Miro face. Um, I'm gonna try Miro out as a face. Um, yes, he's done some real bad heel things, but we will work with that. I just need more faces at the top of the card. Uh, that's the main thing, and I also need to get Miro back to the top of the card, but again, that is something I am working on. Again, still not at the full height of my booking ability, uh, just because I, again, I haven't recorded in a while. Um, these three episodes have these two episodes aren't too far apart from each other, but they're very far apart from Revolution, so don't worry about that. After this, we see Chris Jericho pacing around, and in the inner circle, they're around him, they look a little bit grim. And Jericho says, damn it, bastard Brody decided to mess with Hager. Well, we can still do him a bit of a favor, even if he doesn't want to help us. He pokes Santana and Ortiz says, you two, you're joining me. I'm going over to Tony and make sure that this becomes a three on five. But before he can go out to tell Tony Khan, Stopped by Jonathan Gresham and Matt Cardona, and Cardona just says, we're making this even. And then him and Gresham, they walk away, and Tony Khan, he's just kind of in the background, he awkwardly gives a thumbs up. Tony Khan, not exactly the best on-screen presence, he's not rated on anything. I think Jericho, I think I only have Jericho, Cody, and Coda rated on this. I think I have Cody rated in this one. Um, obviously, Cody and Coda off-screen, both rated on Overness, I believe, Jericho on Entertainment. I think that's how I had it set up. But Jericho, you know, he's, he's a bit angry that, you know, his 4-on-4 four four plans did get ruined. But hey, now he can get Proud and Powerful involved. 
So that's fun, but now Matt Cardona, Jonathan Grisham, they want to join in. This is probably just going to bring the match down, honestly, but eh, it's fine. It's whatever. It's more realistic, I think. After this, the private party defeats the best friends. It, no surprise at all, and Isaiah Cassidy with a 70. Wow, that's good. Uh, yeah, not really a surprise there. And then, after the match, the Young Bucks music plays, and the Jacksons step out, and they're looking very cocky, and they say, looks like Hangman's found some new drinking buddies. Well, your drinking already got you kicked out of one group of people, so I guess the private party are some good friends to have. They won't kick you out for your drinking habits. So, I suppose that's something good for you. You know what? You're gonna complete on, continue on being a complete joke, this complete drunkard, this poor excuse of a wrestler, but you know what? We don't really care. Private Party tries, we might. We've never been able to beat you, but we're gonna change that in this tournament. You better make it through long enough for us to beat you. We're not gonna let you lose to anyone else. So the Jacksons started to turn a little bit heel. We could use some good heel tag teams. Um, Private Party, they're definitely getting up there and popular. I mean, Isaiah Cassidy, we saw he had a 70 rating, which is absurdly good. I think MJF in his title match had like a 74. Yes, they're having a few updates between here and now that probably have changed things up a little bit, but just insanely good numbers by the private party. And having the, and I mean, at this point, you know, in our canon, J the Young Bucks have never beaten the private party. They've tried, but they've, the private party has always managed to get a leg up on them, and they've always had their number, as we see with the storyline. After this, we see Kana in a sit-down interview with Renee Paquette, and Renee, you know, she's indicating that Kana asked for the interview. She's like, all right, you asked me to come here, what do you want? And Kana, she just, ta she just takes Renee's mic. She doesn't even let Renee ask any questions. She says, Ashley Flair, I am the champion. I am the empress of wrestling. I am the greatest woman wrestler the world has ever seen, and I am one of the best wrestlers this world has ever seen. Only one man and has the slightest chance of beating me. He's busy dealing with Chris Jericho. Flair, I know you're scared of me. I am unbeatable. I am the truest, most pure pro wrestler in the world. You are just spectacle and name value thanks to a famous father who I earned my name through hard work. You are nothing to me, Flair. Show didn't have any women on it. Um, that's kind of the main reason I'm doing this. Uh, just a little bit more building. Kana, Charlotte, they've had a long history. They're now at it at AEW. Of course, that's Kana and Ashley Flair instead. But, you know, Ashley Flair, she is kind of getting a fast pack towards a title. Fast track towards a title shot, rather. Uh, but Kana, she's going to stand in her way. Kana's not going to, you know, go out crying. She's not going to go out laying down to Ashley Flair at all. After this, we have Garza Jr. defeating Joey Janela with an El Merdito. And then after Garza's win, he calls Kip Sabian in, who brings a black bat with him, of course. Sting, black bat, all that. He holds the general down as Penelope Ford and Viper put a sting mask on him. Lots of, uh, obviously, you know, with the face paint, not just a mask of, uh, of main event mafia sting. Um, Garza beats down Janela with the bat. He's laughing and he's telling things sting. He's not, he's not really acknowledging Kip Sabian's presence at all. Or not Kip Sabian's, uh, he's not really acknowledging Joey Janela's presence in this at all. And then eventually, Sting's music hits, he walks out with Andrew Everett, Lee Johnson, Griff Garrison. They're just kind of standing there. Sting, he pulls out his own bat, points it at Garza, and Garza's like, Oh no, I'm so scared. Uh, kind of, you know, over the dramatic, uh, you know, overly dramatic with being scared. And then eventually him, the Rose Garden, they walk out of the ring, and they walk past, they don't, they walk right past Sting. They don't even bother with, you know, they, they don't bother with trying to find another exit, they just walk past Sting. Sting just glares him down. Garza's yelling insults. Andrew Everett's yelling insults back. But Sting, through all this, completely stone-faced, completely stoic, not allowing anything to get to him. And our main event, surprisingly well, considering that we did have a couple of weak links, mainly with the additions of Matt Cardona. Mainly Matt Cardona is the addition. And Kota Ibushi defeats... The inner circle, and Kota pins Ortiz with a Kamigoye. 
68 rating. This probably isn't going to be the best show out there, but ASOS and Kotobushi, they both have new hot moves. They both do very well. And, yeah, this was... You know, it's a pretty good match. It's not the best out there. I definitely probably could have gotten better if I just left it as a 3-on-3 three -three, Ace, Sammy, and Jericho versus Kota, Cody, and Scorpio Sky. Um, Scorpio Sky definitely would have been way behind everyone else, but still... I think that it makes a little bit more sense for more of the Nightmare Family to come in, uh, make it a 5-on-5, five five. I can get private, uh, not private party, uh, proud and powerful in a little bit more. So, again, this is probably going to be a pretty bad show, yeah, 67. We lose popularity in a region, which is fine. I am still, again, I, I'll keep saying this, I'm still getting back to getting used to my, um, you know, getting back to booking, because I haven't done it all too much recently, but, you know, kind of... Spawning it back in there, and we'll be back for the fourth week of March in the next episode.